this is, this is, this is. Thanks for taking the time. Nah, no problem, man. I appreciate it. <laughs> what else am I going to do, you know? Not touring. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not touring right now, you know? Uh, man, I'm just, it, it's it's great, you know, kind of going back and, and thinking about sick of it all thinking about um and, and checking out what you guys are doing right now i got into you guys because my well i got into hardcore just through black flag and then i got into gorilla biscuits and then sick of it all but my my merch guy had a a dragon tattoo a sick of it all dragon tattoo on his <laughs> leg actually and um he was this like punk kid from texas you know <laughs> and oh, he was yeah. he was just all about sick of it all so when we finally finally got on warp tour and you guys were on the main stage getting to see you guys all the time it was so good it was so amazing but you know i didn't i was just learning i was just a kid you know i looked up to you guys as as sort of like the big brothers and just like these guys know what's up um but so it was more just me kind of watching you know looking at what you guys are doing more than trying to incorporate myself into it but uh, it was a great learning experience for us and uh, I just appreciate it. you guys were always super solid guys, never jerks. You know, you you uh, <laughs> you back it up. You back up that respect kind of kind of well, yeah, thing. I mean, that's what you know. That's what that's what it's about. It doesn't matter. I know if, uh, we learned it from other bigger bands. You know, like like uh, I tell the story how when I first started going to hardcore shows at CBGBs, like the second one I went to was Agnostic Fronts like Victim and Pain, either the record release or they just came home from the tour of Victim and Pain, the, their their big first album. And I had long hair and a motorhead denim vest that I painted. And Vinny Stigma comes up to me and says, hey, you like my, you know, you like Agnostic Front, blah, blah, blah. And then he goes, cool. And he goes on stage. And I realized that's the guitar player of the band that I came to see. And that had never happened to me before. It didn't happen at a Black Sabbath concert, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, but it was cool. And they, that and left a mark, kind of. Yeah. That's what got me. I was like, I'm coming here every freaking Sunday, you know? And that's when we started going to the matinees. And, and it's like that respect, it went through uh, when we started touring with bigger bands. Like, uh, certain bigger bands had that old metal attitude where it was like you're the opener you get shit you get treated like shit but then we uh, i think we were lucky enough to go out with sepultura was like the first big metal band and they were cool as hell they treated we were the opening band on that tour and they treated every band on that tour equally nice guys so we were like that's how we want to be you know yeah that that makes a lot of sense what what were some of the not so nice guys? Did you, did you guys experience well, you know that? What it, it's it's weird. It's <laughs> never the band, but it's uh, usually the yeah. crew. Some of the crew. Uh, Slayer was a dream come true to tour with them, but their crew was kind of <laughs> split in half. There was a bunch of them, like Tom Araya's brother, and a bunch of the guys on the crew loved Sick of It All. But then there were these other guys who were. Uh, old metal dudes or not even old metal dudes they were young guys who thought that 80s metal mentality and they were like treat they would treat us like shit i remember after the first show you know we're pretty energetic and after the first show this one guy came up and he put he goes to us right before we go on stage you see the red tape all over the place you can't cross that now slayer had this giant drum set already so we had maybe a foot and a half before the the drum riser to the edge of the stage and then two little spots over here. And he put tape everywhere, so we would probably have to stand still. And we were like, fuck this. We just did our regular show. And that guy's head blew up because we were crossing the tape. And then yeah. finally, I think it was Tom Araya came. And there was a big ruckus with the man. They had like five managers on tour. And I was like, send us home. I don't give a shit. And Tom was like, <laughs> Tom goes, he goes like, I asked these guys to be on tour because I like the way they play. Let them do what they want. You know? <laughs> Yeah, that's that's the that's the way to do it. It's like it's kind of one of those things where I, I've been in the same situation where you just you have no space and you're just on the edge of the stage and you're like, I get it. There's a lot of a lot going on here, but you can't really do what you what people love you to do if you're if you're like yeah. pushed in there. Of course, you know the opposite of that is is being packed into some some uh, New York basement or some like hardcore oh. show. Uh, I mean, Coney Island was was. As, yeah. a, as a kind of a perfect example, it's tiny or was tiny, and people just be crawling on the rafters, just going crazy. I don't know if there's uh, legendary places that I don't. Definitely, there's probably 
tons that I don't know about, but I'd love to hear anything that comes to your mind, oh, like God. legendary we, punk rock, I hardcore mean, show, basement shows or venues. Definitely. Uh, we, we got to play. There was a place in Jersey, 288. Uh, no, 288 Lark was up in, in Albany. That was another small, small venue, but it was great. But there was a, oh, I can't think of the name, but there was a video made, uh, uh, a DVD that has our, our show there. We played the very last show. It was a, a house in New Jersey. They used to have, uh, I think the bouncing souls live there and some other guys and it would have basement shows. And it was insane. Cause they, as soon as you started, people would lift you up and you were on the ceiling already. It was like <laughs> yeah. that much space between your head and the ceiling. You know, one of those places where as soon as 10 people get in there, it's a sweat box, but it's just stuff like that. You know? Yeah. That's good times. I mean, Touring in the so before did you start touring with metal bands when you guys started playing shows or was it was it always mixed like that um, maybe not the Sepultura's and Slayers of the world but maybe the smaller metal bands or was it hardcore hardcore and then at some point once you guys got bigger did you start doing it that was, kind of thing like when we started doing just weekend jaunts and all that it was mostly just other punk and hardcore bands but then you'd you'd end up in New England and they would throw on you know uh, there'd be like a thrash metal band we would think it was cool you know and then. Some people mm. didn't like it. I didn't give a shit. You know, it was always fun. Yeah. We always tried to do that, you know, uh, mix things. Like when we got popular enough in the uh, late, in, in like the early to mid 90s where we were headlining, we would go, mm. all right, who do we want to take out? Let's take out Good Riddance, but let's take out uh, Snapcase too. So you have the newer generation of hardcore and then the hardcore punk of good riddance and the funny thing is is all the bands loved each other you know but then we would get shit from some people like yeah you know it's cool but you should take out a straight hardcore tour and we're like what does that mean to me <laughs> yeah. good riddance is hardcore you know it's 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 all the same it's, it's just a different style from the same tree you know yeah you know what's funny about people like that is, is they're just they're, they're always gonna be around and they're always <laughs> they're, you know and uh it's like the comment section on YouTube. You just don't you don't go there. So you just ignore those people. Like, exactly. hey, you know what? Every last I checked, everybody's having a good time at these shows. People are going off, but yeah. you know, it's that's it's. I laugh when I hear that. It's just funny. That's yeah. a great lineup. Snapcase. They were another band that we kind of like discovered on Warp Tour back in '97. Yeah. That was our first year, and I don't know if you guys were on '97 or '98, yeah. but it was, it was one of those '97. That was the year where we were just like wide-eyed kids in a van, just all these hardcore bands that we had heard about but never seen live, yeah. you know, so, and, and, you know, we were into all sorts of punk rock and, and hardcore at that oh, point. So, yeah. I mean, everything was, the, was just 90, uh, amazing. We did the very first one in 95 and that was uh, uh, amazing. And 97 was, uh, what we was that out. like? What was that like? The first it was one, it, it was nothing <laughs> was set up, like no infrastructure kind of no, thing. Like I remember we joined, they had a few shows, and then we joined it in San Antonio and uh, we were we were on the truck stage, which was the uh, initially the second stage. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember when we were playing, uh, the, the crew didn't know sick of it all. Like they were all from the West Coast. Some of them had heard of us. They never saw us. And uh, when we were going on, the guy goes, you know, this is a monitor system. And we're like, yeah, we know we've played shows. before. <laughs> yeah. And they're really nice guys. But then they go, OK. You're going on, uh, but you're going on 20 minutes after Sublime goes on the main stage. So don't be upset if nobody comes over. And we're like, we don't give a shit. We played San Antonio like seven times already, you know, in our career at that point. And when we went on, the fucking, it looked, you know, it was like a charge of people over the hill to come see us play. And the guy just lost his shit. You know, he was like, <laughs> oh my God. And, you know, we had a great show because San Antonio was like our art. That was our spot in Texas, more so than Dallas or anything. At that point in our career, for some reason, the people in San Antonio loved sick of it all at that point. Man, San Antonio, there is something about it. Something in the water in San Antonio, but they're a great town for hardcore and punk rock. And, what, and What's that? What was the club? The, uh, there was... Uh, well, there was the, the White Pig or that's the... The White Rabbit or something? White Rabbit, that's it. White something Rabbit. Like yeah, that's the yes. one. I was yes. oh, what a great sweat play. box. They, yeah, <laughs> and they they actually they they change it up. It's it's now a different venue now, which we've played. It's much bigger, much more open. Wow. It's cool, but uh, yeah, the White Rabbit that was uh, that was fun. There's something about San Antonio. Shout out San Antonio. What's up? Yeah. Uh, 
you know, it's funny. My buddy Gary, Gary Barbo, my my our old merch guy, that's a huge sick of it all fan. He was saying like, he was like something about you saying like tear it up Texas style, and he. As a kid, when he heard that, being from Texas, it was like on one, one of your live records or a yeah, live recordings. A, a, it was like on a, a one of the tracks. We, we put out an EP and then we added live tracks to it. And I think I say, stomp it up Texas style. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. See, things like that you don't even think about. But that that hits kids and hits you know fans, yeah. listeners in, in weird ways. And he was like telling me about it. Like, man, ask him about that. Like. Like, why? Why ask him? Okay, I'll ask him about it. But uh, it, it's just like one of those things where so, one little sentence, he's probably listened to that that album over <laughs> exactly, and over yeah. and over. Yeah, craziness. But Texas, love it. Um, yeah. But being from New York, I mean, when, you know, what was it like touring when you guys left your sort of your the east coast was it weird going to places like texas and and what yeah. you know nashville and kind of country you traditionally knew, country <laughs> you never knew what to expect we didn't know if we were like like nashville would be like are people gonna show up here do you know do they like this kind of music here you know and it, it did it worked you know it was yeah. great it was fun going across country and, and meeting different people who Again, from the they, we all love the same bands and the same and and but they they would have a different aspect of like you know we came from New York and it was New York hardcore that's you know that's where we grew up and this this and this and and but you could all talk about the Dead Kennedys together or Minor Threat and it, you know it goes for uh, you know hanging out with again like metal bands or even we did show a bunch of shows with the Mighty Boss Tones at at a certain point and we would just sit backstage and talk about. You know all the bands we grew up listening to, and it was great. Yeah, that's great. Uh, you know, speaking of of like reminiscing, uh, what was it? Uh, based on a true story, just turned eleven years today. Yeah. I think it's today yep. to, as we're as we're person. recording this. This will come. <laughs> this will come out pretty soon. But um, yeah, that's that's a trip. I mean, like the day that we're recording this, eleven years ago, going back through your catalog. From you know the early stuff, clobber in time, and and uh, you know based on a true story, this you know the 2010s, you know that came out in 2010. You you put out um, what so what was out in 2006? The uh, one right before that, Death the Tyrants. Death yeah, the Tyrants. those were like really great records in a weird time in music where you know things were starting to like get get weird. But going yeah. back through your catalog, man, it's just super solid. Every release Thanks. has just bangers and just it explodes and in your new record i know we're talking about based on a true story a little bit but like your new let's get to your new record after that because i want to gush about it but i don't want to i don't want to step on on the based on a true story yeah, birthday yeah. let's what do you remember about about making that record um anything that was, any oh, stories it was great it was um uh... The the album before it was the first one we did for Century Media, and we had a we met uh, two Matson who I, I had met him. He's a producer, and uh, and I had met him when I had sang on this band, The Haunted. I did a song with them, and we made a connection. And he said he, he ended up working with us, and he flew to New York uh, to do Death by uh, Death the Tyrants. Then when it came time to do uh, Based on a True Story, he suggested we go to Denmark. So it was the first time we we recorded in Denmark. And uh, it was in the winter time, so there was maybe an hour of sunlight every day. So we just had nothing to do but sit in the studio and work our asses. It was always cold, raining, and then the sun would come out for an hour, and then we go back to the studio and work. Was that pre-planned? Like, hey, we're gonna have a lot of time because of the weather, or was that just like, oh, we didn't nah, realize? <laughs> we didn't realize. He was like, yeah, come over. You know, they don't care. It's like, you know, oh, yeah. it's dark for six months. We don't give a shit. But you know, we're there. We're like, where's the sun? He goes, it's winter. And we were like, what do you mean it's <laughs> winter? No... <laughs> but uh, but it worked out so that you know we really busted our asses on that one. It was a lot of fun. You know, how long did you spend over there? So only three weeks. Three know? weeks Which of darkness. And, and yeah, three weeks of darkness, and then. Uh, uh, he had a, we had a bunch of friends from Europe come and, and to do backups and some friends from New York just paid their own way to fly over and hang out. And, uh, you know, it was great. It was just the atmosphere was really, you know, we got down to work, uh, when we recorded here, like the last few albums we did in Staten Island. And, and again, it was great and it's fun, but there's more distractions, people dropping in or mm -hmm. like, 
if I'm sitting there and they're redoing like guitar tracks again, I'm be like, all right, I'll cut out for like four hours. But there we were all in the mix the whole time. Yeah, it's a, it, it, it definitely changes things. You know, there's whether it's not always noticeable, but to you, I think it's noticeable. And, and um, you can't always do that, right? You can't, especially these days, you know, everybody's got crazy okay. schedules. But the last MXPX album, we did that as much as we possibly could, even though people were sort of like doing things during the day. But everybody would come in every day <laughs> at a certain time and we'd stay, you know, yeah. most of the night and then do it again the next day. But it, it's uh, it's fun. I mean, making a record. What did you guys do in Copenhagen when you weren't there wasn't anywhere to go? Was it was things closed no, up I mean, because it, it was dark? No, it was, wasn't that, you know, but we we spent hours working. Then a big thing was all having dinner together. We didn't really go and hang out. We went to a couple of shows while we were there at a small clubs that were fun, but mostly we were just there to work, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and just, we just had fun hanging out. Like, uh, I tell a story that I put up on, on our Instagram and Facebook that, uh, every night after we we'd finish, we'd sit down in the, this living room area with, uh, two and the whole band and we would watch old Iron Maiden DVDs and just freak <laughs> out and be like, look how good this is, you know? And then uh, our bass player got this whole idea. He goes, what's Paul Diano doing right now? Because this is years after he had stopped singing for Maiden, right. his solo act. And he was like, we got to get him to sing on the record. And he freaked out trying to get him to sing on the record. But it turned out uh, by the time they contacted him, it was too late. And he wanted some huge amount of money because he was in the... Uh, uh, financial trouble for evading taxes in england oh so no we we're like yeah we love you man but not that yeah. much that's a lot <laughs> maybe you can get him on on cameo for the next one yeah he's probably, <laughs> probably on it man yeah probably right <laughs> craziness wow yeah so so you what was did you guys ever record in the u.s outside new york yeah for uh uh built to last we went to la for a month and that we was that your first record like in la yeah that's a great record by the way thank you it, it so was, what was that like what was what was it like being in la opposed to new york recording it, again it really didn't affect us it was it was fun you know we had a uh, we had a lot of friends dropping in but it was fun it was really <laughs> yeah. good. The, the the thing i think for some people especially a lot of our uh, some of our hardcore fans are like it's a good record but it's a little too clean for you guys and i think that's uh, Garth Richardson, who's a producer, he that was his idea to try to push us to a new level. And uh, but, what do you think about it now? What do you? I mean, do you feel like it's still? Do you feel like it's clean, or you're you're like, no, no it sounds I, good. I don't. I don't <laughs> think. I think it's fine. Uh, I remember a friend of mine, uh, Matt Fox, who plays in the band Shy Halud. He wrote a review of it when it first came out, and he goes like, "Oh, it's so disappointing after scratch the surface." You know, they have their built-in warp tour choruses, and I was laughing. Oh my god! Because just because they go, wait a minute, we added "whoa whoa" in the first song. Every other song after that is heavy as hell. We got one song where we yell "whoa whoa," and then that's built-in warp tour choruses. And now he says, "Oh, I love that album now," but back then I just wanted heavy, heavy, heavy. Which I understand. When I was a yeah. kid, I wanted everything fast with a mosh part. You know. So, so speaking of like anthems, I mean, you know, Bulls anthem on the on the is it the latest record? Uh, yeah, that was the waking latest, the yeah. wake the sleeping Breaking, dragon. Yeah. Great record. It Thanks. slams. I love it. Uh, I mean, even though like I recognize a lot of your your older stuff, I, if I'm gonna put on a sick of it all record, I'm gonna just put on your new one. It, it sounds so good. So back to Bulls anthem. I mean, that's very melodic. It's almost like wait, what what is this? I mean. <laughs> <laughs> what, what do you get? What do you get from stuff like that? Like, because it's great, but do you do you get a lot of shit from it from the hardcore hardcore fans? It's really strange um, when people might say stuff against songs like that. Like, oh, you know, it's good. It's but it's really melodic. But when we play those shits live, those are the songs that yeah. really explode. You know, like yeah. the whole place starts singing it. We at one point before. I think I don't remember when it was, but it was way before we recorded this album, uh, the last album. Uh, I ran into people outside of a show we were doing in New York, and the first group was like, "Yeah, you know, your new record's really good, but you should stick to the heavy stuff." And then you go five feet down the line, and somebody goes, <laughs> "Your new record's great, but you should do more melodic stuff. You know, more of those like step down and and us versus them." And I'm sitting there going, "Like we do all of that shit. That's you know, it's the way we grew up. We liked 
you know, we grew up loving metal. Then we got into, you know, punk through like, you know, the Sex Pistols, Plasmatics. And and then when we met Armand, he introduced us to New York hardcore. You know, like he was more we were all into the English stuff, you know, mm. the exploited and and the damned. And that was our and Motorhead, especially. That's what uh, we how we met Armand in high school. We all love Motorhead. And then he goes, you know, there's a scene right here in New York. And he played us like Agnostic Front and stuff like that. So, you know, we loved all of that mixed together. Hell yeah. That's why, I mean, that's why I love you guys so much is because I like hardcore and I like that old school UK punk. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's just got, it's kind of got everything that I would listen to as a kid. If you listen (laughs) to the first MXPX record, which no one should, but (laughs) (laughs) it's got like hardcore parts like guitar parts yeah. and stuff you know and it's funny you know we'd play with metal bands growing up and in the scene here in Bremerton Washington and we'd get made fun of like people would be, would would be like who's this and they would they would have a guitar like a clean guitar and be like dan 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 like it's it's mxpx you know cuz we were so clean compared to you know the metal sound that they yeah. had we didn't even have like all the right the right guitar pedals and stuff we just yeah, had like an, that's what it is. some old crappy practice amp that our first guitar player had you know things like that but it's funny you know again it's the comment sections man i mean you guys do it all you do it well and some there's always somebody that's not gonna have the same perspective so i always say just you know respect your fans but just don't actually listen to them (laughs) (laughs) that's good advice that's good advice yeah it's funny i saw a uh you know people put up these videos this guy did a video he said uh it played metallica songs with a punk sound and and mm. you're you're licensed and then somebody wrote in the comments maybe somebody should play this guy propaganda which is true <laughs> i didn't realize i go yeah all these song propaganda's been doing that for years you know that style but with their own sound they didn't you know make it more metallica sounding you know right and 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 they're super influenced by metal bands and metal yeah if you listen to them these like metal riffs all over propaganda stuff and yeah. mxps has been influenced by propaganda and sick of it all and like all these you know as a songwriter i'm i'm listening to all these punk and hardcore bands exactly. over the yeah. years and how can you not be influenced by it so uh and it goes the same way for us it's like especially my brother he loves he writes some really good like oi influence stuff but then he incorporates the next generations of the more melodic punk stuff and sometimes I write stuff and I'll be like, you know, I can't sing this shit. <laughs> we all laugh. <laughs> he laughs at me, but, you know, we try. But that's yeah, so that's, good. Yeah. <laughs> How is it? Is it still, I mean, still good working with your brother? And, and I mean, I'm sure it just feels like everyday life to you. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's the same thing. Uh, th- this whole pandemic thing, it, it it's weird. The last few years we've done it where we all wrote separately and then we get together for three weeks because my brother lives in florida now and okay. Armand, the drummer lives upstate new york craig still lives in queens i live in new jersey so that's we how would pete's write... gotta keep his tan you know yeah exactly <laughs> <laughs> that's why he works out all the time he doesn't have to hide it under a winter coat you know that's what i remember about you guys is pete was always working out doing push-ups on the side i'm like okay that okay noted all right I'm not quite confident enough to do it in front of everybody, but yeah, gonna... exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, but so when COVID hit, we were used to writing separately and then just getting together for mm-hmm. like three weeks at a time and doing, uh, that's you know, cool. getting banging the songs out. But, uh, I think more of our, our, my personal favorite is when we just would have weeks on end in a, in our practice space and write like that, just making songs up on the spot and all that, mm-hmm. uh, our mind, to work alone if you were going to do that yeah if you were going to do that like would you have would that be every day but then you'd go home and sleep in your bed at night like it's not like you're spending the night with the whole band like at a no, no. studio then, right no when we used to do it like that uh we all we were all just disperse go back to our homes you know take uh, a break decompress yeah. come back get come back fresh at it yeah that's always <laughs> good yeah good i mean i want to talk about the present day more but i still want to ask you about uh waking the dragon a little bit yeah that's fine crazy white boy shit <laughs> i gotta when credit I... armand with that see i said armand likes to work alone and he came yeah. in with his song and he goes i'm gonna tell you the title it's called crazy white boy shit and right away <laughs> i knew what he was talking about because okay. when we were growing up you know and we had friends who you know growing up in queens it's a very mixed 
uh, it's one of the most mixed boroughs in New- it is the most mixed borough in New York City. So your school was filled with everybody. So you had friends who were into hip hop. You had friends who were into salsa only who came from South America had never heard crazy punk rock. And we would play them stuff. And I and remember playing our, uh, we had these two Rastafarian friends who had this store. And we'd go to their store and they'd go, hey, check this out. These guys are Rastafarian. I play them the bad brains. And they would go, this ain't no Rastafarians. That's some crazy white boy shit. And so uh... Armine remembered that. And then when he, he wanted to write a tribute to the bad brains, and he said, I'm going to call it crazy white boy shit. <laughs> oh, that is so good. It's such a good song. But now that hearing the story, it's even better. Yeah. But yeah, when I, when I first heard that song, I was like, my ears perked up when I when I heard, and then it breaks down, crazy white boy shit. Like yeah. it's just yeah, well done, well done, Armon, well done, you <laughs> performance was great. Yeah. Came out good. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's it's got to feel good to to put out a, a record so recently that fans love, that old school fans love. Um, uh, I mean. How I mean that that I guess I'm just thinking about the future. Does that does that mean like, well, I guess this shit's not ending yet. We got to keep going. Like, does that what what it feels, or you feel like okay, we want to end on a good one. Like, where's sick of it at's head right now, yeah. going forward? Oh, that's a rough one. It's like every time we sit down to write a record, I say to all the guys like, if this shit sucks, we're not putting it out, and we're done. You know, but <laughs> right. You know, then all of a sudden Pete will bring in like, you know, like back then, like a take the night off. When we when we first uh, started writing for that record, the first song he gave me was take the night off. And I was just like, whoa. And this out, al- uh, the last album, <clears throat> I remember them bringing in songs. And it was great because Craig brought in my two favorites, which was uh, uh, what do you call it? Inner Vision. He brought mm-hmm. Inner Vision, the, the opening track. And as soon as I heard it, I go. Without lyrics, I go, that's the opening track to the album. And Craig was like, are you sure? And I'm like, dude, listen to it. It's got to be the opener. And then we sat down and uh, our producer on that album, he was the engineer for the uh, all the ones we did with two, two Madsen. And then they kind of reversed where uh, Jerry Farley became the producer and two Madsen would just he just said, as long as I get to mix the albums. And I think it's working out great. But uh, Jerry Farley was really good with forcing us to do lyrics, forcing us to go out of our, you know, norm. Like when we did, when Pete brought in Bull's Anthem and we were sitting there trying to write it, he was like, don't be scared. Just fucking write the song. No, you know, oh, it doesn't sound like sick of it all. Tough shit. Just write it, you know, because yeah. when Lou's voice is on it and Armine hits those drums and Craig's bass sound, it's going to be sick of it all, no matter what it is. <laughs> Which yeah, is true. Craig's bass sound, you know, you nailed it. It's It's like, that's... Yeah. There's there's all the four parts that make exactly. sick of it all sick of it all and, and when you guys are together it sounds like sick of it all it doesn't matter what the song is it could be Mary had a little lamb <laughs> I, I encourage you <laughs> do it <laughs> but uh, you know what I'm saying it's it's uh, yeah. Craig's bass sound oh my god and it's it, that's a, something he has this magic bass uh, it, it, it's called a music man and he he's only found one other and he found and it and. He bought this red bass when he was 16, I think. And that's the one he used in the studio. He used to tour with it all over the world, but he's too, he can't find any others. So he keeps that one at home and he tours with others. Uh, but that bass and his setup, so many people come up to him. I remember, you know, the guys, from, the bass player of Anthrax came up to him one day. He was like, hey, because they grew up together. And mm-hmm. he's like hugging Craig and saying, hey, man. And the first thing I was like, dude, what the fuck did you get that bass sound? And then yes. uh, Joe from Rise Against, it was like, when he goes into the studio, he goes, okay, here's Craig's bass sound. Let's start with this and grow from there. You know, and it's it's amazing to me that, you know, and I mean, you can look, we did the, uh, the quarantine videos from our houses and the first thing in the comments, holy shit, listen to that bass. You know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Good. He still got it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, the first, like, if you listen to, like, I think it's clobbering time. The baseline starts and just like, yeah, it, it makes you pay attention. And then I could just every time I hear that song, I think of the pit and I think of just everybody <laughs> going off. Yes, it gets me pumped. You know, that's like good yeah. pre-show music for us. But um, yeah, the baseline's great, man. Uh, <laughs> where, where, where do we go from the baseline? Yeah. You know, the the rest of the sound, I guess. You know, obviously, 
you know, Pete is insane on guitar. And, and the thing I remember about you guys, I, there's a lot of things I keep remembering, but seeing Pete live and seeing him jumping <laughs> while playing and doing change, yeah. like guitar changes in the air, just like, what? I, I usually wait for like, you know, an easy spot in the song, but okay, you go. And you just go <laughs> off. It was like, that's how to do it. And, and nobody else could do it like that, it, it, that I've seen, you know. So props to Pete. And, and I know that's not necessarily about the sound of, of Sick of It All, but I mean, it kind of contributed, no, you know, just the is, intensity. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the, people always ask us, like, why do you, you know, like I go, I remember going to see uh, Hatebreed when they were getting bigger. And I really love the sound. They're intense. But at that point in their career, they were all just standing still. And I was like, it kind of takes away. We grew up in the era of, you know, Murphy's Law, the Bad Brains. Reagan Youth yeah. was a, a band who the singer was just all over the stage. Not angry or intense, but he just moved. He moved all over and it, and it kept the energy going. You know, it's great shit. And that's, a, you know, we grew up having to set our goals to be as good as those bands you know absolutely absolutely i mean that's the thing is you see something i think as humans it's natural you see somebody make a record or i mean the kind of record like a uh <laughs> like a basketball record you know you you want to beat their record you yeah, know exactly and, and and that's the same with with music is you see somebody jump and you're like i want to jump i want to jump high i want to go <laughs> i want to climb on the scaffolding and and through you know through the rafters <laughs> and get crazy yeah. And it, yeah. it's funny because you don't know who's in that audience. And then years later, we, we did a, a festival together with like Story of the Year. And uh, I forget the name of the guys from Canada. But uh, and they were all like going to my brother, like, you are such an influence on us. And then you watch them play and you're like, oh, shit, look at him moving like Pete, you know? It's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah. Cool. <laughs> but, you know, it, it's like a good compliment. It's, it's yeah. Great. Yeah, it's 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 it is what it is, man. You guys have been doing it for so long. I mean, you were pros before my band even started. You know, <laughs> MXP started in 1992. You know, and you guys were already well into it, well, well into it. In '86, I think, is when you guys got together. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. it's intense, man. And and you guys are lifers. So so now we are 2021 here. Yeah, like you say, it's 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 you never know what's going to happen. You want it to be. You want it to be authentic. Every record you make, every every tour you do, you don't want it to just to be a grind. I mean, it's been a grind, I'm sure, over the years. But yeah, there were certain eras. Like um, towards the end, the last record on Fat felt like a grind, and it wasn't. You know, Fat America was great at the time. Fat Europe started to slack. You know, we were killing it, selling out. You know, twelve hundred people here, eight hundred people there, and then we'd sell like two records in that town. You know, and it was just like, come on, man. What year was even, that? Oh God, uh, early two thousands. Because I remember uh, we left, and then we took like a year and a half off, and then okay. we wrote. We started writing for uh, Death to Tyrants, which was two thousand six. So early. Oh early yeah, and yeah, a lot Mike, was a lot of turmoil was going yeah. on. In even the even biz. Mike uh, apologized us about Fat Europe. <laughs> he, he said, "Yeah, there's some," but you know, Mike was always great. You know, I remember just running into him. On tour, we'd be touring, and they and we'd pull into a gas station somewhere in America, and there would be a an RV, and we'd get out of our van, and we'd be like, "Oh shit!" and see Fat Mike. It was good. Yeah, I mean that's cool. Yeah, and the thing about with records is you have you have so much you're putting into it, so much time that the the artist is putting into it, but a lot has to come together for it to get get out there to the people, yeah, to, to you know the right stories be you know being told, but you know there's a lot of process to it that. Honestly, as an artist, I have no idea really half of what probably goes into <clears throat> distributing a record, making a record. I mean, these days yeah, it's, it's changed completely. Mm -hmm. And uh, have you ever thought about going DIY at all? Are you guys still going to, if you make a record, you probably have a, you have a label you work with right now? We, we still work with Century Media. We have one more record with them. And our manager is begging us to do this last record and then continue on our own. But we'll see. We're... It, it's kind Did of. Did he say why, or your management say why? He he thinks it's it's much easier now, you know, with the, the with the uh, digital outlets, all that stuff, you know. Mm -hmm. he, he, you know, a lot of people say record labels are obsolete. You know, they're definitely not given the uh, 
advances they used to give in yeah, the, uh, and that's in the, the 90s is, and the 2000s. Of course, everything's changed, you know, and, and, and nobody could foresee all the digital royalties that are happening. Exactly. Yeah. And so I think it needs to be restructured. I mean, there's definitely – record labels are doing well, mm-hmm. and a lot of artists are doing well, but there is a disconnect in, in somewhere along the way where – the royalties are being based on the old style, like how many CDs yeah. did you sell, and and not you know, and so I think once we we figure that out, it's going to be a lot better to work with labels. But until then, I, I'm I'm going to go out on a limb without knowing much about your band business. If you can, if you have the guts to to do it alone, to do it DIY, at least try one record. Yeah, uh, see. that's going to be really interesting because. You'll you'll have you'll own that record completely. Exactly. Yeah. No percentages to a record label, so it's just cutting out a middleman. And the, um, you, yeah, I know. I was gonna say that even like our first two full albums that were on an indie mm-hmm. that got that indie got bought out by Sony Music, and we don't even own those records. We we begged them to give them back to us, but they would rather license it to other labels, like to put out a vinyl version in in Italy or Germany. They're making more money than that than if they had just given us back our, our the rights to those records. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I would like to do that. I would like to own the record. Like you said, the problem with us is we're so set in our ways. You mm-hmm. know, Like, oh, let's just go record, and then we get it mastered. We do everything with the sound and the art, and we just give it to somebody, and it gets done. If we you give could... that up, we'd yeah. have to fucking... So yeah. here, here, here's, here's something. I mean, if your management is you know, has some balls and they want to take on, you need, artists need a partner. They need somebody that's not the artist that can yeah. speak, help speak for you when they're doing deals and stuff like that so you don't look like an asshole, right? But <laughs> we get you the best stuff. But uh, as far as releasing, self-releasing, stuff like that, uh, it is a lot of work. But you could figure it out. You could figure out how to do it as long as you're willing to do more on the promo end. Um, yeah. And give your management the tools to get it distributed and up and hire a publicist and stuff like that. At the end of the day, it's a lot of upfront money, which is why bands go to labels, you know, for exactly, that upfront yeah. money. But if you can come up with that up- upfront money, the money on the back end is going to pay you back much more. Exactly. And yeah. Nothing's right, foolproof. So There's no, you can always lose, but <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's like stock market, you know? It's like, yeah, but I mean, <laughs> I like to bet on myself. If I'm going to bet, I want to bet on myself and not That's true. somebody else because I, I know what I'm doing. I don't know yeah. what somebody else is doing. So I, I guess just being yeah, my own true. artist has been, led me down that road of betting on myself over and over. Well, that's good. That's good. I'd bet on you guys. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I got to, like well, I said. I got to teach these old dogs a new trick. That's all. <laughs> I, I, honestly, I think just keep making those good records. Make if if every record you make is as good as Wake the Sleeping Dragon. I mean, Thanks. you have nothing to worry about. You can keep putting out the records. You don't have to go crazy every time with with promotion. I mean, it helps. Obviously, yeah. the more money you spend, the better. And honestly the more money you spend it, it's almost like you can't tell <laughs> these days because it's just like a black hole of ad money going into google and spotify yeah. and oh, God, yeah. facebook and all that you know stuff that you guys don't want to worry about i'm sure right <laughs> i don't know how to do do the ads but find find you know management that knows it, how to do sure, yeah ad. like the ad yeah. thing or even just post and you know uh i learned from taking over the band uh social media the people like oh here's a logarithm you have to post this uh, you know if you're going to post post it this time because that way you hit your european fans coming out of work and your asian fans waking up and the east coast fans at this you know all at this time is your best time to post don't post seven times a day and i'm sitting there going i have friends who are independent like you know bands or hip-hop guys or whatever and they're posting like 25 times a day I'm yeah, like, how come they're not following the, the this fucking logarithm or whatever, you know? Yeah, yeah, I know. Well, honestly, I mean, I think it's different for everybody a little bit, but uh, I agree with you. I, I only post usually once a day and I'm done just because of the fact of like it takes too long, too much yeah. mental time to like figure out what to post. and Exactly. Uh, yeah, but, I, you know, everybody, I would just try it, you know, and be like, hey, I want to post 20 times a day. I'm going to see if they all get 
two two likes or something. Yeah, but you see, know, that's but, the thing. I'll post. Say like I post a video at the time they tell me to. You know, like they're and then and it'll get say like right away you'll get oh three thousand likes and then two hours later post something else and you get maybe two hundred likes and then maybe a few more the next day. But you're like, is it that's not really just work. the time, but that's also um, that's almost like um, I don't know, like eclipsing your other post. Yeah, maybe it pushes that one down. Yeah, it pushes and it down, and so nobody sees that one. But also, you know, it depends on what your post is. If it's not something super nostalgic, you ever notice like on social media, they always want nostalgic yeah. or exactly or a fight or something. <laughs> yeah, Our, uh, Armand. One day, I forget we posted something about like the second album, and it got right, you know, like twelve thousand likes right away, and then yeah, like. He's like, yeah, we just put into a record out and got like three thousand likes. What the fuck? You know? That's what it is, man. It's the it's the algorithm. It's not. It's people people would like it if they saw it. They're just not seeing it. Exactly. Yeah. And and that's the thing is like these little ins and outs, these algorithm things. It's good to learn for sure because it's gonna make a difference overall. But I, I feel like it's just a long game in general. Um, yeah. Life is a long game in general. I mean, I try to set up your life. So that you're you're somewhat happy, you know, and if you have to really grind right now, yeah, men, you know, you have to mentally prepare for that. You know, it's just like getting on a long flight. If you go to Australia or Europe or wherever, <laughs> you mentally go, all right, I'm going to sit here for a while. Right. Yeah, exactly. But if, you, if you didn't know you're going to sit there for a minute and you're like all of a sudden on a hey, come this way, you're getting on a flight to Australia. We'll see you in 14 hours. Oof. You'd freak out. You'd be like, wait, no, I don't have my. My snacks and my pillow. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It's oh. crazy. I have weird, weird analogies, but that was a good one. <laughs> <laughs> but the sick of it all sound is, uh, <clears throat> it is, it's still going strong. I love that you guys are still working it. Wh whatever you decide to do, whatever level of DIY, um, yeah. just make the records you're making. You know, don't listen to me, by the way. Like I said. <laughs> Make a new record. Make a shitty record. I don't care. Just no. keep making it. And and I think that's the key to to these days, to the present day of music business, is just keep feeding people what they want, which is yeah. music. And, and and I want to make music too. So it's not it's not a bad deal. It's like yeah, all right, I'll take the job. My job is to keep feeding people what they want. Just <laughs> shut true, like just shoveling Homer donuts in hell and he just keeps eating the donuts and he's like god damn this the devil's like i'm running out of donuts here but i, I kind of feel like that's the analogy people will will always love what you do as long as you put your heart into it and and, and it means yeah. something to you i mean that's why we we take some people like it used to be only maybe two years between records if mm -hmm. that you know usually it was quicker but the last since 2010 on we've taken our time between records because yeah we tour a lot and then was like when we're done doing the u.s and europe then we hit south america then you go to asia then you go to but we're also like we don't we want to have quality songs you know uh when we were on fat especially the last one not that it didn't have good songs on it the, the album uh, life on the ropes has some really good songs on it but there were some that are half baked like you know if we had sat down with that song and really worked on it it could have been huge or you know huge in our eyes is in a great song but uh mm -hmm. now we just really take our time you know you know what it takes it, it probably takes a lot of those experiences looking back to realize that because i mean it's hard to edit in real time it's hard to know i mean just thinking back my own experiences in the studio or with with my band putting together songs you're going off the energy and you don't realize, oh, maybe we should have rethought that line or this part or whatever. But yeah, but uh, yeah, I feel that. I feel that like you can't go back, though, can you? All you can nah. do is you just learn for the future. You learn for the future. So so nowadays it takes you a little longer. You're editing a little bit more. Yeah. Uh, do you do you it, go back and rewrite like whole parts sometimes? And Sometimes. And, yeah. Yeah. Sometimes. yeah. Uh, like, you know, but then there's the other end where like somebody will bring in a song and just yeah let's see what this sounds like and we just play it and we're right all right that's perfect we don't got to change anything on that you know but other times we'll be in the studio and you know craig comes up with some great ideas like we'll do something how about after the second chorus 
we keep the riff but break it down you know a little slow here and then kick it back in you know just stuff like that and mm -hmm. we'll try it and it'll sound everybody will be like oh shit you know he's good at hearing shit like that so sometimes it's, it's yeah sometimes it's hard because you have too many good parts and you're like we can't <laughs> it's just gonna get lost man we gotta like maybe save that for a different song you exactly do that? yeah, yeah. <laughs> we've done that where we've, we've written a song and we didn't record it yet and then we're like you know what would go good? That part from that song that we didn't record. Let's take that that part and mix it with this. You know. Yeah, uh, that's great. It's great when that works out. As yeah. a, you know, when you're trying to put something, you're like something's just not right. We need that that extra ingredient. So, do you play? Do you play guitar at all? I you just write uh, yeah. bass. You play you know, bass. Uh, well, I did. I did. <laughs> don't anymore. Now I just let those guys. Like I'll explain to Pete. And it's funny, we wanted, we always wanted to do this. And I think we did a little bit and there was a, a documentary called the story so far that they, the fat records did with us. And I don't, there's a little clip where we're in the studio and the way we explain things to each other is like, yeah, you know, the part that goes, da -na 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 -na, how about we go, da -na -na -na, you know, just that's the way <laughs> I explain shit to like Pete. I'll call him up and be like, yeah, you know, your new song you sent me. Well, you should do the riff. What if a riff like this and I'll make, you know, guitar noises or whatever. <laughs> So. That works. That works. That's great. Works for us. Yeah. Yeah. So okay. So you mainly just write lyrics. Do you like yeah. writing lyrics? Yeah. Yeah. You I do? mean, I try not to repeat myself. Sometimes I freak myself out, and I'll be like, "Am I saying this right?" And, and, you know, because then you have a concept of what you want to say, but then I have to fit it into this, the riff and the and and the mm. melody, and I'm just like, "Shit," you know. That's hard. It's like a puzzle, yeah, right? Yeah. So, so yeah. take, take me through the process a little bit because as a songwriter, I'm usually writing the lyrics of, of a, you know, with a guitar. So I can like exactly. literally change the guitar part. Oh, you know what? I'm going to fit this guitar part to like fix this lyric or, you know, the melody. But you, yeah. you're doing a little differently, right? So when we first started, it was definitely where Pete would write a, a song or, you know, and then he would give it to me and I would make the, the lyrics fit the music. And now that we're, you know, uh, more experienced, um, all four of us writing together, sometimes uh, there'll be where, a part where like sometimes now Pete comes in with the song with the lyrics or partial lyrics and then I'll go in and finish it. You know, I've done I did on on uh, Wake the Sleeping Dragon. I did uh, finish three of Pete's songs and one of Craig's. And then I wrote some myself and Armand likes to write. He's like you. He writes. Uh, lyrics and music together because if he writes the song he wants to put the lyrics to it and so he's always like he it's funny because we'll go into the studio and and like when we're writing and we'll say all right pete will play a song or craig will play one of their songs armand will be like what if we change this part and we're like all right let's try it but when armand comes in he's like here's my song we're like well what if we change that part no nah, it's good the way it is <laughs> <laughs> that's it Oh, uh, it's funny. You know, it's funny. Like my trick in the studio. I hope my guys don't listen. They don't listen to this podcast. Uh, <laughs> is is especially with Tom, our guitar player. If he has a suggestion and I don't hate it at all, I always do it. We always do it S rather than like my idea. So like if because if, I'm writing the whole. I mean, I'm writing all the songs anyway. Yeah. And so like I want him to like have input into stuff. So if he has an idea that doesn't suck, I always go with it. Just to like. Yeah. Yeah. You know, just, hey, yes, bring your ideas. Let's go. Yeah, that's the, that's the way to do it. It's, it. People always ask, like, oh, you guys have been together so long. And what's your, what's your you know, what's the secret? There's no secret. It's, it's treat everybody equally. Yeah, we give uh, each other a lot of shit. We always give Craig a lot of shit for some reason. I don't know why. The, the bass player, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, uh, we treat each other equally. We, everything is, you know, equal in the band yeah. as in dividing up when, when it's it, no matter how much like like when we uh, the anniversary of death the tyrants was uh, and i was talking about that where on that album we would rehearse and i had just moved to new jersey so i would drive our mind to the uh, train station grand central so he could go home to upstate new york and then i would have like a 45 minute drive home so by the time i got home he got home and he would text me he's sitting in a train and he would write lyrics to the new song that we just wrote so that whole album, I wrote one song. He wrote all the other lyrics on that album. But yet we divide all the money equally. Yeah. You know, you know 
that's the secret is you got it like like you tell your bandmates you got an idea you don't like this give me an idea whatever yeah it's got to be like that you know you got to contribute and and be in it for the long haul you know that's the thing is sick of it all it's not a, a fly by night kind of production you know you guys are here <laughs> you guys have been in it yeah. you're gonna be here and uh i think those those principles that you carry with you are are have to be a major factor in, in why you've been so successful and yeah. why everybody loves you know just the heart of what you guys do i saw you guys in uh it was uh slovenia it was like punk rock holiday yes uh yeah i was gonna ask if was that was was that the last time we saw each other was it at uh what was that remember the punks at, in in uh san antonio i think remember the punks was the last time because yeah. that was a little little more recent yeah. Wow. Okay. I, yeah, that's yeah, insane. Slovenia. That, that that's one of the best festivals ever. That uh, punk rock holiday. That was so much fun. Yeah. <laughs> I, I I had a I had a fun just as a just like a punter just walking around, <laughs> enjoying the you know the festivities. And yeah. Seeing all the bands play. It was cool. Yeah. Very cool. Well, what do you what's before we we'll wrap it up soon. I don't want to take too much of your time, but uh, I'd love to talk about just what excites you today. What are you into? It doesn't have to be music. It could be anything. I mean, tennis, I'd say tennis, but I haven't even played this year. <laughs> <laughs> tennis. All right. I used to, I, I love playing tennis, but I just haven't even played. It's the, the weather's been nice and I haven't had time, but uh, I like to do things that are active that aren't, aren't hard, you know, like aren't hard mentally, like, like tennis is fun. It's just sense, like yeah. all of a sudden I'm tired and I can't breathe. Oh, I was having fun. <laughs> I was playing tennis. It's so like things like that. But like I, I like to stay active. I like to work out. But man, it's just it can be a grind, right? So yeah. I mean, I'm, is there anything? It doesn't have to be physical activity. It could be I mean, like I like watching movies and TV and that's it or whatever. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I love movies. But uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, it's, lately, uh, mostly it's been me and my daughter. You know, my daughter's uh, – turning 11 next month and uh we just hang out a lot you know i mean she has her friends of course but it's mm -hmm, like mm -hmm. like hey dad let's go ride bikes hey dad and so that's great so we go awesome. ride all over the neighborhood it's it's great uh that's what i've been mostly spending time with my daughter now that things are opening up more uh i've been getting calls from friends and hopefully we're gonna get to hang out again but yeah it's, i mean just to relax i i, I read mm -hmm. mostly fiction and actually a couple of biographies I read. What are you uh, reading? I read Bon Scott's biography, which was great. Oh yeah, and cool. uh, I just started the Market Ramon book, but I I know a lot of the stories because a friend of mine worked with the Ramones, and I just like that he's coming out and saying, you know, telling the stories now. You know, oh, that's cool. That's really cool. Like, like I know a lot of people didn't know that uh, KKK took my baby away was Joey writing about Johnny stealing his girlfriend and ended up marrying her. Yeah, I, I kind of, you know, what's funny is we, we, we cover that song, and, it, and I love that song, and I had heard sort of that that angle, but I, yeah. I didn't really, I would love to get more details on that, if I, you wouldn't it, mind. I think it's in the book. It's in the is book. it in the book? And, <laughs> but, I mean, the, the what I was told from my friend who worked with him is that, and I know a lot of people are going to hate this, but Johnny Ramone was a card-carrying member of the KKK. And so, wow, so see, I met this girl... And they yeah. were like dating. And then one day she goes, oh, I'm going to go on vacation to California. And she goes, <laughs> but she went with Johnny. Yeah. And then they came back married. <laughs> and oh, my God. That is. I, and I asked my friend because he, he worked with them for the, like the last two years. He got to go with them as a merch guy. to when they went to Brazil for the first time and they sold out state, he said, you wouldn't believe it. People were just chanting outside the hotel 24 hours of, hey, ho, let's go. 24 fucking hours outside though but he would tell me that they would be backstage and wouldn't nobody would talk to each other you know like he would make a joke and they would all laugh and talk to him but they would barely especially he said especially johnny and joey wouldn't even speak to each other oh my god well i had heard that makes sense but i'd heard that johnny was like a republican so that's probably where the kkk yeah. thing well, so I was took a turn. Card carrying member, but card carrying member. Oh my god! Like oh, what? It sucks. Okay. It sucks. Heroes a dick, you know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Maybe it hey, was I mean, what do you? I don't know. <laughs> yeah, that's weird. That's crazy. Good song, but that that's a great song. I mean, it, it, yeah. What else? I mean, the the Ramones are are a band that are just so 
for me, enigmatic. I mean, for you, they're a little more real because you grew up a little closer to people that knew them. And I don't know if you ever got to, to meet any of them. I never did. I, I met uh, Joey once backstage at a, a Murphy's Law show. And he's just, mm-hmm. you know, just nice, nice guy. Uh, I always tell this story. And, and mm. when we were first young little punks, we lived in, I lived in Queens, New York. And I was in Flushing, Queens is where I lived. And we were coming out of the subway and across the street going into the other subway was Dee Dee Ramone. And we go, we were little uh, punks. We were all young. Yeah, fuck you, Dee Dee. You suck. And we <laughs> hide behind the car and he'd look around. You know? That's actually, <laughs> I, I have met Dee Dee. I've met Dee Dee. So I've met a Ramone. Oh, that's good. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He wrote all the hits, right? He was great. Right, right. Yeah, no, I mean, they were all they were all characters, right? They, I mean, they, just, they were like, to me, they were like the punk rock monkeys or something. Maybe because of the look, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they just looked like they were from a different world from where I lived. I, you know, it's like, okay, yeah. awesome. It's funny when they, we always uh, like to get in arguments with our friends in England and they, oh, punk started here, punk started. I go like, when the Sex Pistols went into the studio, they had the Ramones album and said, we want to sound like this, you know? So right there, it tells you where it started. <laughs> there it's you just, go. There you it's go. It's like, you know, when you give shit to your friends from Chicago, like Chicago pizza is okay, but we're from New York, so. <laughs> Punk rock started in the U.S. That's that's what you're saying. Yeah, With the Ramones. Pop, you got the Ramones. <laughs> Iggy Pop, yeah. MC5, come on. Oh, my God, MC5, so good. Kick out the jams. Yeah, you're right. You're right. I, I mean, the, it's funny watching like the old footage, like the the MC5 playing in some park, and they're killing it, going wild on stage. The whole audience is just like, if he's staring at him. <laughs> yeah, there's something about. I think Americans got a lot of their influence from UK, from England, and vice versa. A lot of the people in in the around the rest of the world got their influence from the US. And yeah. so maybe it's a thing where if it's too close to you, it doesn't feel as interesting or like, you know, your hometown bands, you know, like you get yeah. so many, you get so many shit talkers because it's like, oh, they're no guy knew them when they were in the, in grade school, you know, exactly. shit in yeah. their I mean, pants, eating their boogers. <laughs> you must have heard that all the time. You know? Yeah. I mean, that's the thing. Is it, it's kind of cool. Like they keep you level headed, but it's also you just want them like, you know, you come home from a fucking great tour and you're like hey we fucking played this huge place look at this sold out show in japan and, and they're just like yeah you're still an <laughs> asshole or whatever you know like oh your band it's yeah 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 but you know what it, it just teaches you to be tough and have tough skin and <laughs> there's always somebody talking shit and and that's yeah. never going to change no matter what you do if you're willing to go out on a limb and say something and stand up for something people are gonna talk shit so you're doing it right if they are, I think. That that's what what I always said. Exactly. I always have be doing to, something right. <laughs> I always have to remind myself, you can't please everybody. Uh my brother Pete has the best philosophy. He never reads any reviews, good or bad. He never reads comments in anything he posts, you know, or anything we post. I'm always like, Do you see what this asshole said? Smart. He's like, Who cares, man? He's <laughs> got it. He's very zen. He must meditate. Yeah, I, <laughs> <laughs> I can picture Pete like doing a, a lotus or something <laughs> right on well thank you so much man is there anything uh you you want to let people know coming up or anything or just yeah, where just, you want people to go we're Any, just wh- writing we're just writing right now and uh you know figuring out how to navigate the uh crazy time we're in you know just yeah. seeing where we go from here you know we're always on instagram facebook all that crap yeah <laughs> sick of it all new york city yeah, that's the one. Hell yeah. Sing roll NYC on Instagram. Go give them ah. a follow. Well, uh, I'll be looking forward to it. I'm glad we got a chance to to catch up. It's been yeah. way too long. Hopefully this time next year we're playing festivals together somewhere. Yeah, I hope so. I hope to see you. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, my friend. Appreciate Thanks for it. having me, man. Thanks for doing it.